It's a rough day today. You get a couple of days off. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm on. Okay. It's on. Everything's working. <laughs> All right. Well, let me start with uh, something that Luke wrote in his gospel account. And this is what he wrote. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So this was a story about enduring faith. And at the end of this story, he said, when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? And I think we can say during his time on earth that Jesus was on a mission to find faith on earth. But even among those chosen to be his disciples, he was asking them, where is your faith? So his efforts to find faith were not going well until this next account happened. But this discovery was not expected to happen. And we might say, well, why is that? Let's find out. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, you ready? He was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this. Where? In all Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, Go back home, because you believed it has happened, and the young servant was healed that same hour. Now, why was Jesus amazed? Well, the source of this faith was a Gentile, not a Jew. And his level of faith was advanced. It wasn't at a beginner level. How rewarding was the outcome of this man's faith when he went home? It was the joy of seeing someone he cared for deeply being helped. Isn't that wonderful to think about this morning? So I've asked Bill Lapp if he would lead us in prayer. Go ahead, pray. Father. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We pray for those who couldn't come for some reason. We pray that you'll bless them as well. We pray this morning for the kind of faith in our lives that that soldier had. And we thank you that we can have it if we trust you. We thank you for again for this opportunity. We ask your blessing on this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I'm so glad my friend made it. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and open our hymnal to number 578. 578. When you find your place, join me in standing, and we're just going to sing the whole song. Number 578.
Nicole, Denise, and Mariah have an announcement to make. Yep. All right, come on up. <coughs> Sunday, we decided to have this sun, next Sunday, the 20th, as our harvest dinner. So those of you that sign up, thank you. The list looks very well. There's only one item that I didn't sign up for, and it's not, if it's not here, it's not here. It's not a big deal. Secondly, we have October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So today, we would like to um, honor Pastor and, and appreciate him for all that he does for his congregation. <clears throat> and um, after the service, there is a huge cake that I need help eating downstairs <laughs> and some beverages. So please join us. If you can't stay, come down and take some home with you. Um, Eli, can you bring the bag that you have up here? Sunday, 
And so be sure and get your name on there and come. It's going to be a wonderful time after the service. And then business packets. Yes, everybody is encouraged to pick up a business packet. Okay? If you come, you pick one up. And it's in the back there. And we're going to do the same thing as we do all the time. If you look it over and have a question, you can ask me in person or you can call me at home on the phone this week. And I'll answer any questions you have. Um, you can vote. Member households can vote um, even today before they leave. Or sometime if you want to vote early, you can call me and register your vote. Otherwise, Saturday, next Saturday, I will be calling to register the votes on the packet. So I hope that's clear. Then last week, uh, I got a lot of feedback about, boy, we want to know these guys' names and numbers. So as you see right there, the leaders are listed with their number beside them. Okay? Everybody's listed. So now you've got a sheet to take home, and you can put it on your refrigerator, and you'll know who to call. Okay? I hope that's helpful. And then next, I have a note from Karen Metzger, so let me read this to you. Hello, Pastor. I wanted to let you all know I got my birthday card and was so thankful for it. I apologize it's taken me this long to acknowledge it. On my birthday, I flew to Atlanta to spend some time with my daughter and her family. What a blessing that time was. During my grandson's nap times, I was able to pull out my computer to keep up with some work. I didn't want to fall behind just because I was visiting with them. Thankfully, I was able to schedule all my Zoom meetings for either right before I departed or soon after I got home. Please let the congregation know that I got my card. I've read all their names and I'm so thankful to have each of one of you as a part of my ministry team. Your prayers and support keep me going and loving what I do. With love, and praying for God's continued blessings on you all, Karen. So again, thank you for signing the cards in the back. It does make a difference in their lives. Uh, let's see. Next week, we're going to have a special offering for what we're calling hurricane relief. The need there for the places that have been ravaged by hurricanes is considerable, and it will not end anytime soon. So I had someone approach me about, can we do something? And I said, sure. And so next Sunday, we'll take up a special offering. So pray about this week what you can give and then come. I'll have a plate in the back specifically designated, but also if you want to put something in the offering plates here, just make sure you designate it and we'll make sure everything that comes in will go in some fashion to Hurricane Relief, okay? Through whom? Huh? Through whom? Yeah. You know, I haven't decided yet um, two things. There's an organization called Eight Days of Hope that I have just become familiar with that they just specialize in disaster relief and they do it all across our nation. And their ministry is such where they go into a disaster area and they do everything for the victims for free. They feed them. They enable them to be showered. Um, they rebuild their homes. They do everything, and it's all for free. They're called Eight Days of Hope. They're based in Mississippi. And right now, they have uh, people on the ground in all the states that have been affected. They have over $7 million in equipment that they have deployed to these places to help rebuild. And they actually... Uh, broadcast here in our local vicinity uh, every Saturday at 10 a.m. on WDCX. And so they have a program that I've heard a couple times. So, and it's very highly uh, recognized. They actually even have come into Buffalo and did rehab in Buffalo residential areas in the past, in the fall. And so that's an organization that is very, their whole focus is disaster. <coughs> That's what they do. And so they have 271 uh, volunteer leaders that are trained by them. And then they use all kind of volunteers. And the number of volunteers that they have are in the thousands. 
So they go into disaster areas, do amazing ministry, and everything that they do, rebuilding homes or whatever, is of no cost to the victims. It's all free. So that's one of the organizations that I'm thinking <clears throat> might be a good place for us to channel our funds. And it's a totally Christian organization. They believe in Christ and they're sharing the gospel as they go. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah, if you think of another one, there's Samaritan Purse, because they're 100%. Yes. But I like this Eight Days of Hope as I've become familiar with them, what they're doing. So their focus is strictly on disaster right here in the U.S., what they can do in that regard and where they're deployed. Okay? But haven't made a final decision yet, but that's in my thinking in the background. Okay? All right, I have two prayer requests um, that I'd like to mention to you. Um, one is a granddaughter of Ida Carmichael. And when I got back on Thursday, I had a message on my answering machine, and she had called me sharing the news that her father, after a lengthy illness, had passed away. And so she was asking if I would do the funeral service for him and the burial service. And so I got home about 9 o'clock at night, found the message, and then called and talked to her. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm going to be doing that. Um, as far as I know, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet her in the past. So I know who she is and who her mother is, which is Randy's sister and all. So I've had interaction with them in the past. So, but... We would covet your prayers. I mean, there would be a lot of unbelievers present at this time in the funeral service, so it'll be an opportunity for them to hear the gospel again. But I would covet your prayers for them. Her name is Nicole. So we're praying for Nicole and her family. And then the second prayer request I have, and that is Genevieve Hare. Uh, went into the hospital yesterday. She's not local. It's uh, up in Buffalo, Millard Fillmore. Um, she was having an issue with her throat, okay? And so it's a procedure possibly that might be real simple to treat that condition and she could be released real quickly, but uh, we need to pray for her also. Okay, so let me pray for these two requests. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your kindness and your love and compassion upon us, Lord, and for everything you've done for us and I thank you so much for everyone here in the congregation who has uh, served and loved and shown great kindness to me and my family throughout the time we've been here it's been a blessing and so I don't take these uh, efforts to show kindness and love lightly it's a real blessing in our lives and I would pray your blessing on everyone here and everyone that's a part of the congregation. And then we think of Daryl celebrating birthday this week. We would pray that he would have a blessed week and a great day celebrating. And then we do think of the requests. We think, first of all, of Nicole and her family and the passing of her father. We know that this is a challenging uh, time in anyone's life when a loved one like this passes away. We would pray for Nicole and the family, especially for what's ahead this week, especially on Thursday funeral service and then going to the graveside, we would pray you do a great work in the hearts of those present, that something good would be accomplished in their lives. And then, Lord, we also think of Genevieve. We ask right now that you would be with her, uh, help her, Lord, to get the best treatment possible. We would pray that her stay would be short, that she would be able to be uh, back home soon. Thank you for what you're going to do in this situation, we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, I don't know whether to sing or just to say let's greet one another after we already sang. Find us faithful, so I'm going to say let's just get up and greet one another. All right?
I know her much better. Hey, Oh, I don't think 
and open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Whenever we feel deep gratitude toward others, then we long to show it in ways that are memorable. And as I was preparing this, I had no idea that what just transpired with what's happening to me today was going to happen when I'm talking about this. Isn't the Lord amazing how sometimes he puts these things together? And I'd say quite often we struggle in finding the best way to show our gratitude. And I'm sure this could be the case for those young in the faith seeking to show gratitude toward those who happen to be veterans in the faith. What might be surprising to the young is that they have many ways to do this, as we will learn from this group of young believers in Thessalonica. How did they express their gratitude to those which brought them the gospel? Well, as we learned from our previous study, Timothy was sent to check up on them due to his lesser profile. And what did he learn about this group to report to Paul? Well, let's go down to verse 6 in chapter 3. And he writes, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news, notice, of your faith. I'm thinking this news about their faith revealed something about them, that they had a strong faith, not a weak faith. And how do we know this to be true? Well, let's start with the circumstances. They were under severe opposition from both Jews and Gentiles in their city. They have no place to hide because everyone knows who they are and where they are. They didn't have a seasoned spiritual leader to rely on during the absence of Paul and his team. What do people with strong faith do in the midst of such a terrible onslaught against their faith? Well, the old phrase is, they circle the wagons. Or we might say, they simply keep doing the work of faith. And how do they do it? Well, here's what the writer of Hebrews yields as an answer. Listen to this. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We are to draw near in full assurance of our faith to who? We should draw near to God. When times get tough and rough, then we should increase our time with the Lord, not lessen it. How did these young believers stay close to Christ apart from Paul in their presence? Well, here's the remaining answer given by the writer of Hebrews. Listen to this. In response to all he has done for us, let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. Let us not neglect our church meetings, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. Now, what do we learn about this young group of believers based on what the writer of Hebrews said? First of all, they didn't abandon each other. That's good. They stayed together in the exercise of their faith. It's easy to abandon coming together in the faith when your group has suffered attacks from the opposition, like they did when Jason's home was violently entered into with those being present dragged out. 
Wrap your minds around that for a minute. That's what happened to them. The home they met in was violently attacked and people entered and drug everyone in the home outside. It takes a strong faith under those conditions to say what? I will be here. And then keep your word in showing up. These young believers didn't abandon each other because they had a strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through this expression of their faith that others like Paul and Timothy felt a deep sense of gratitude towards God. You see, they're having a great impact upon their spiritual leaders in that sense. This is not the only expression of their gratitude being demonstrated, as Paul writes. Look again at verse 6. Let's read this part again. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith, and notice, and love. Their love for Jesus is on display for all to see. And we might say, well, how exactly? Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. I think we can conclude that they were obeying everything they knew to be the commands of Jesus. And we might say, well, like what? Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So they treated each other with love and care just like Jesus would do for them. This is another reason for why they wouldn't abandon being with one another because they loved each other so much. You don't walk away. You don't abandon those who you love from the bottom of your heart. They also treated Timothy in the absence of Paul with love too. I think this was in obedience to the commands of Jesus also. He said to his disciples, which became apostles, those who welcome you are welcoming me. And when they welcome me, they are welcoming God who sent me. If you welcome a prophet because he is a man of God, you will be given the same reward a prophet gets. And if you welcome good and godly men because of their godliness, you will be given a reward like theirs. And if, as my representatives, you give even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, you will surely be rewarded. So Timothy could even report that they obeyed this command. For they received me, apart from you, Paul, without any difference in their treatment of me. It is through these expressions of love witnessed by Timothy, that Paul is feeling a deep sense of gratitude to the Lord for them. He's, he's thinking, Lord, can you imagine their loving like that? Yes! And again, what are we noticing? This young group is having a profound effect upon spiritual leaders like Paul and Timothy. Imagine that. A young group like that could have that much influence. Yes! Here's the next expression of gratitude found in them. Look at the remainder of verse 6. And that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. Now let's talk about relations. Relations between spiritual leaders and the flocks of believers that they serve. And we would say that those relations can become strained. 
quite easily over any circumstance. When this happens, it can be a very heavy weight on the hearts of those leaders as they seek to see those relationships restored. Sometimes the relationships remain broken in spite of every effort to see restoration take place. The believers in Corinth, okay, they had an up and a down relationship with the apostle, which weighed heavily upon his heart. Here's one example when it turned upward from a very low point in their relationship. He wrote, please open your hearts to us again. For not one of you has suffered any wrong from us. Not one of you was led astray. We have cheated no one, nor taken advantage of anyone. I'm not saying this to scold or blame you. For as I have said before, you are in my heart forever, and I live and die with you. I have the highest confidence in you, and my pride in you is great. You have greatly encouraged me. You have made me so happy in spite of all my suffering. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. Outside trouble was on every hand and all around us. Within us, our hearts were full of dread and fear. Then God, who cheers those who are discouraged, refreshed us. How? By the arrival of of Titus. Not only was his presence a joy, but also the news that he brought of the wonderful time he had with you. When he told me how much you were looking forward to my visit and how sorry you were about what had happened and about your loyalty and warm love for me, well, I overflowed with joy. Isn't that amazing? Paul seemed to be at a very low point due to the possible feeling of negativity towards him from this group. But that was quickly replaced by the encouraging message and report delivered to him from Titus. Our lives in God's family can have a positive or a negative impact on those entrusted by God as spiritual leaders. In this ongoing absence of Paul from the group of young believers in Thessalonica, it could have caused him to wonder if they will still be positive towards me after all that was being said about me by the opposition. As we can see, the report delivered by Timothy was that their love for him had not diminished, but only increased their desire to what? To see him. Their feelings for him were no different than his feelings for them. And this certainly led to a deep sense of gratitude on his part toward God for making this possible. Oh, this is wonderful, Lord! Again, I would say, would you ever think that a group of young believers could have that much impact on a seasoned apostle like Paul? And they did. Sometimes those young in Christ think that what they do is really not significant enough to inspire anyone, especially a spiritual leader like Paul. The enemy of our souls would like for those who are young to believe that statement is true. But I will tell you this, it isn't. How do young believers, like those living in Thessalonica, inspire more seasoned believers like Paul? How do they inspire? Look at verse seven. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Now we know 
Paul had sent Timothy to Thessalonica from Athens. And what was the mission? Back up to verse 2. The last part. To establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. What is the result of the mission? Paul says, we were comforted by your faith. How is that possible? We all know that these young believers were under a heavy attack from Jews and Gentiles in the city. They were dealing with false rumors about Paul. They were separated from their spiritual leader at this time. How great is the percentage that they wouldn't last? I'd say it could be as high as 7%, maybe even upwards to 90%. They'll never make it. There was a very strong possibility they're just going to fold up. Now let's shift our thoughts to Paul's current circumstances he's living with in Corinth in writing this letter. Luke writes, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, listen, don't be afraid. Can you ever imagine the Apostle Paul being afraid? Well, the truth is, he was afraid. Hence the message. Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't quit. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul being ready to quit? Hence the message. Don't quit. For I am with you, and no one can harm you. Meaning what? He's facing harm from others. In Corinth. The message goes on. Many people here in this city belong to me. You see, this helps us to understand the context of his expressing being in distress and affliction. Over what? It's persecution he's receiving from unbelieving Jews in Corinth and unbelieving Gentiles too. He's frustrated. He's fearful. He's discouraged. Until he hears about how these young believers are living out their faith in the midst of their own circumstance of hostility. Now, Isaiah the prophet wrote in a future prophecy these words. And a little child shall lead them. Think about that a and a little child shall be them. In Paul's life, we could say that the little children of Thessalonica are leading him by example. That's what we can say. They are doing what he should do. The young in Christ are those with limited abilities can still set examples for all of us to take notice of. As a pastor, I am always encouraged whenever I see younger people in the faith doing what I should be doing too. It primes my pump. It gives me what I need to keep going. And as Paul said, I am comforted and knowing you are continuing in the faith. Wow. Now, can you imagine Paul got the vision from God and he got the report from Thessalonica probably about the same time. And what that did for him in his situation was overwhelming. Another thought from Paul on the way these young believers inspired him is found in verse 8. Look at verse 8. It's not very long. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Amen. Do we ever want to give up after many years of service to Christ 
And I would say, yes. Yes. Whenever we see things go horribly wrong, huh, or trouble comes in a very heavy form, when I am tempted to give up, then I just think of faces. Faces. The faces of people who are younger in the faith, but are serving faithfully in spite of their own troubles. And that leads me always to ask, how can I do any less? If they can keep serving, then so will I. This is what Paul is pointing out about the impact of their service upon his life. Here's a very inspiring account written about them to the believers in Corinth, okay? Listen to this. Paul wrote, Now I want to tell you what God in His grace has done for the churches in Macedonia. The churches of Macedonia are Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Though they have been going through much trouble and hard times, they have mixed their wonderful joy with their deep poverty. And the result has been an overflow of giving to others. They gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And I can testify that they did it because they wanted to and not because of nagging on my part. They begged us to take the money so they could share in the joy of helping the Christians in Jerusalem. Best of all, they went beyond our highest hopes, for their first action was to dedicate themselves to the Lord and to us, for whatever directions God might give them through us. They were so enthusiastic about it that we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to visit you and encourage you to complete your share in this ministry of giving. Did you hear what Paul said? They did more than we could have dreamed or hoped possible. And he is thinking, if they would do that, then I will give of myself in the same way. Where did they learn to give of themselves to the Lord like this? Where did they learn that? Well, he said something important to them that they knew to be true. Let's back up to chapter 2, and let's look at verse 7 and 8. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. They gave themselves to the Lord in response to Paul giving himself to them in the name of Christ. You see, sacrifice begets sacrifice, and then more sacrifice. If sacrificing yourself is all you have been taught, then you do the same. The teacher of sacrifice is encouraged to keep sacrificing when those under him practice being sacrificial themselves. It's kind of like it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Quite often here, we have taken on new missionary candidates through a pledge. A pledge to give above our regular giving each month until the time would allow us to add them to our budget. And usually we have asked you to commit to a year in order to begin this process. And I know it is a sacrifice for many of you to give. <clears throat> and I will say it instills in me the desire 
to keep making sacrifices myself as I watch you do what we have taught you to do. See, their sacrifice inspired me <coughs> to do what? To keep making sacrifices. Can you imagine that? That a group of young believers would have that effect on a seasoned apostle like Paul? But they did. A third thought on how these young believers inspired Paul is found in chapter 3, verse 9. Look there. For what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Now, I call this increasing the joy and gratitude in the heart of a spiritual leader to God for the opportunity to serve such a group of young believers. Now, I'm going to go back in time for myself. From my early days of teaching math in junior and senior high school comes this thought of the joy in serving others. You see, I had certain classes I hated to teach. And others I loved to teach. And you might say, why was that? It was the attitude and the effort of the students that made all the difference in me. Some groups of students had bad reputations, and others had good reputations. And it might surprise you, but we as teachers talked about these things so we knew what to expect from a group we had never taught before. And quite often, I would find that they either lived up or live down to their reputations. Young believers can increase or decrease the joy in the hearts of their leaders in so many ways, but especially this, involving their desire to learn and their effort that they put into practicing what they learn. This group made Paul rejoice and give thanks to God from the bottom of his heart. You wouldn't think that young believers would have that effect on seasoned leaders like Paul. But they did. John the Apostle writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. In another letter, he wrote, I rejoice greatly that I found your children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. These young believers had the right habits in living the truth and in learning the truth, which inspired real joy in Paul. The last thought on how these believers inspired Paul is given to us in verse 10. Look at verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. I would take it from this comment that Paul wanted to be with this group desperately. Would you agree with that? By what's worded there? I have to admit, now I've got to go back in time, I have to admit that I have had jobs where it was a struggle to come to work. And struggle to go to work. You might say, why? Why? Because of the people. Because of the people I would have to be around. Every day, you know it's going to be the same ordeal all over again. Every day, every day, every day. And that makes it hard to go for it. Really. Because of the people. After reading about the 40 years of service that Moses gave to the children of Israel, I can't help but think 
it must have seemed like 400 years to him. Right? 400 years. If you would ask me if I would like to trade positions with Moses in the wilderness, I would tell you flatly, no way. On God's green earth would I do that. And I think if I had been there leading them and they threatened to stone me, I might have said, hey, just wait a minute. I'll go get the stones <laughs> for you. So you don't have to look for them. Just put me out of my misery. Paul doesn't feel that way about this group of believers in Thessalonica. And he longs to help them mature in whatever way they could be lacking in their faith. Now, what a difference we can make upon anyone's service to the Lord. That's the point. They inspired Paul to keep serving with joy and with the desire to keep helping others because of what they were demonstrating in the short time they had been in the faith. All of us have potential to do some amazing things for one another. For one another. Let me ask you a simple question. What kind of difference are we making in the lives of those here, here, around us? Is anyone comforted because we're here? Is anyone inspired to do more as they look at us? Is anyone rejoicing? When they watch what we do? Or is anyone reluctant to serve us? Reluctant to be around us? Because they know it's going to be very unpleasant to do that. What can we do? That's a good question, right? What can we do? Here's a good start. Live by faith in Jesus. Amen. You know, that solves a lot of problems in your life and your contact with others. Live by faith in Jesus. And with that, do this. Obey his command to act in love for one another. Amen. That's it. Remember what Paul said? Timothy has brought a report about what? Your faith and your love. <laughs> I like simple things like that. I feel like I can do something simple. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we just rejoice over what we have read. It's very exciting and encouraging to see when those who are young in the faith have such an amazing impact upon those who are older in the faith. And this is a very classic example of that. With these young believers and their interaction with the Apostle Paul. Our hope is that we would be like those young believers in Thessalonica to everybody that's in the faith whether they be young or old or in between, that we can live in such a way by faith and we can love as an act of obedience that would have great impact upon everyone we rub shoulders with. And we think about our lives and we think about where we're at right now. Maybe there might be one thing that's not pleasing in your sight or two. This is a great time for us to get those things straightened out, that we might continue to grow in our faith and grow in the love that we show, and that we'll continue to please you. Thank you, Father, for giving us this time 
to spend together around your word, that we might hear it, learn it, and put it into practice. We give you glory, honor, and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, for our last hymn, let's go to number 568. Okay, and then I don't want you to stand up yet. 568. Because I think what I'd like to do is have Beth play this through one time just so we can get the tune down. It's not very long, as you can see, two lines. But it's a wonderful, wonderful, I guess we could say, prayer or commitment or challenge for us, for ourselves. So number 568, can you play that all the way through for us, Beth? Okay, let's join a stand, okay, and we'll sing through the whole song. Every word begins, every verse begins with May, and it's a good place for us to be. Thank you for each and every one that came today, and I ask that 
to bless each and every one, lift them up spiritually. We also ask you, Lord, to be with your Israelites, lift them up spiritually, touch their lives, bless them, Lord, and love them as long as you love us, and we thank you for that. We also, Lord, we come and we ask you to bless the cake that we are about to partake in, come and enjoy with us, and we thank you, Lord, for it. We just thank you for all 